happy to welcome all of you here. You know, it's relatively early. People have to fight the Google-generated traffic. You know, the what is it? You know, the Google traffic. Um, uh, but uh, thank you, you know, the group that made it by 9 a.m. Thank you for being here early. Um, well, it's 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 a distinct pleasure, you know, to have this conference because. Uh, What's happening in the open cloud ecosystem is that the speed with which we're moving is just incredible. I mean, it feels that way when you're inside. And um, what's, you know, uh, we're used to, you know, two large conferences that happen in the two summits. And it feels like between the two summits, so much is happening that there is a huge demand to kind of share it with all. And this event, uh, is becoming somewhat of a like a mid-cycle, you know, business meetup and technical meetup that we're having, and I uh, just want to thank the foundation for you know allowing us at Mirantis to help you know put this whole thing together. So this is this is wonderful. Uh, so the theme of this conference uh, is kind of akin to the times. So what's happening is we all saw the report from Forrester that actually talks about uh, OpenStack being ready and OpenStack um, being uh, viewed by the customer community as the fifth platform that uh, people can use in their cloud journey. And you know, so when you look at the other uh, four, um, we have three public cloud platforms that people take very seriously. Clearly Amazon, you know, Google Compute Engine, um, and Microsoft Azure. And on-prem, people are looking at VMware and now OpenStack. So OpenStack in the five years that it's been alive, and uh, some of us are wearing the, you know, the, the letter five here, you know, the, the, the five-year T-shirt, so it's, it's, you know, it's still a toddler, I guess, at five-year-old. Uh, there you go, that's the, that's, that's the T-shirt. So uh, at, at the age of five, uh, OpenStack has become one of the most important platforms by mind share in the, one of the most important journeys that technology um, it, you know, is, 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 is conducting, which is migration of the world into the cloud. So this is a great accomplishment for us. But also, not only it's a great accomplishment, it's also a great responsibility, because when people look at you as, you know, a viable alternative for something, uh, or a first-class platform on that important the journey, it's no longer about just the infrastructure or just the thing that we've been talking about. It's about making this a compelling customer experience for the whole stack and uh, for customers to be able to use this platform to make sure it continues to innovate, make sure that it stays competitive over, over time with the other alternatives. And this is, you know, it's not just the kind of the inner OpenStack community anymore. It's about, you know, OpenStack movement opening up and bringing partners from every walk and every you know, technology direction that's happening in the industry to really enable open cloud, right? And so the theme of, uh, of this conference is what are those partnerships, how do we bring them together, and how do we harness the, the mind share that OpenStack has garnished in the, in the idea of open cloud to build the platform that becomes not just the fifth platform, but really the preferred platform and the number one open platform that customers can really use and count on for years to come. So that's the theme of this conference, um, and I'm happy to um, welcome uh, Joe Weinman, who many of you know, who is gonna be the, the MC of this event. So please have fun, and we'll see you, um, you, know, during, you know, during these two days. Joe? Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Structure again. Oh, I'm sorry, at the uh, OpenStack Silicon Valley Conference. Um, I have to tell you, I was asked to do this, and I thought, you know, okay, well, that sounds interesting. And then as I saw the agenda build, it's just uh, it's a superb lineup of speakers. They're everyone, anyone, everyone, the entire world of cloud computing thought leadership and the people that are making it really happen are here. There is one vendor absent for some reason, but um, for the most part, um, the lineup of speakers, um, it's the people that have been defining cloud over the last decade. So it's really uh, just gonna be an amazing event. Um, I have some housekeeping items. Uh, there are restrooms and they're somewhere out there. 
Um, okay, so it's a pleasure to be here also at the um, Computer History Museum. Um, I've uh, flown by 101, kind of doing 80 miles an hour or so. No, not really, that's obviously a fake story that couldn't possibly happen. But I've been up and down 101 lots of times and never swung by, so uh, I was talking with Lou Tucker earlier who actually, before cloud computing, um, invented or helped construct and engineer one of the first thinking machines, which is here, so that should be uh, pretty cool. Um, and it's interesting that OpenStack is here at the Computer History Museum, um, because some people would say that OpenStack has made history, so it's appropriate. Uh, on the other hand, other people would say it's the future of computing, so I'm not sure why we're here. Um, but in any event, uh, it'll be a great event, uh, thanks in part. Uh, to all of you and also, of course, to our sponsors, which include uh, IBM, Google, uh, NetApp, Rackspace, and Intel. So let's maybe do a big round of applause for them. Okay, so I'd like to review the roadmap for the day. Uh, there's a cocktail party at 5.30. Okay, thank you. Oh, wait, before the cocktail party, basically uh, this morning everything will be in here except for the uh, breaks and a few sponsor moments. We've got a great morning set of keynotes to kick things off. We've got James Staten from Forrester, uh, who is now at Microsoft, but you know probably is the single uh, greatest analyst on cloud computing and has been for a long time, so that's an interesting shift. We've got Craig McLucky. Uh, from Google, uh, and uh, we're going to kick things off with Jonathan Bryce, Executive Director of OpenStack Foundation, as you know, uh, and he's got a special guest customer, which is Amit Tank, Tank from uh, uh, basically what was DirecTV and is now the DirecTV unit of AT&T. And so this morning, they're mostly going to be focusing on uh, the state of OpenStack, uh, the relationship of OpenStack with containers. Uh, what those companies are doing and also what it all means for DevOps and then we'll have a break uh, and then we'll bring them all back on stage and I will be uh, moderating them in the first panel discussion. So if you have any pithy evil questions that you want me to ask them, come grab me at a break. Otherwise, um, I've got some uh, good things to get things kicked off. So without further ado, I know it's really a lot of fun listening to an MC Yammer on uh, rather than actual content, but that said, we'll just make a quick switch and bring out our first speakers, which are Jonathan Bryce and uh, his guest star, uh, Amit Tank. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's good to see everyone here at this, uh, this event again. It's um, growing, as, a, as most OpenStack events do. It's really cool. One of the things that, uh, that I love about the OpenStack community is, is how global it is. And uh, it's really cool to see these kinds of events happening all over the world. Since the last summit, we've had them in, uh, in Germany and Hungary. We had the first one ever in Istanbul in June, about 500 people there in Turkey. Um, we just had a couple. One was in India. One was in Taiwan. I think there were around 1,700 attendees in Taipei. So, you know, it's, uh, you guys are a part of something that is, is great to see happening here in Silicon Valley, but it's also happening all over the world, and it's much bigger than you know, any of us or even this, uh, this event today. Um, to start off with, I actually have uh, something that is uh, a pretty exciting announcement for the foundation and for me personally. Um, as many of you know, we started the OpenStack Foundation three years ago as a nonprofit that would be dedicated to the, uh, the long-term um, care and management of the OpenStack project and the community around it. And we just received word that uh, after a very long and intricate back and forth with the Internal Revenue Service, <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys have ever had to go through it, but they're thorough, um, we, we are now recognized as a tax-exempt nonprofit. Yeah, and it's, it's great because there, you know, that's a recognition of what our community and our foundation is doing for the cloud computing industry as a whole. That's the only way you get that designation. And uh, from a practical perspective, 
it's awesome because we're going to be able to have um, you know, more resources to invest into the community over the long term. So very excited that, uh, that we have achieved that. So to start with today, you know, one of the things that we always talk about is how critical software is to every organization today. You know, they have to um, make use of it, they have to build it, and that's what's driving so many of these technology shifts, whether it's cloud, whether it's containers, you know, it's amplification of the entire economy. And you know, we talk about that as, as the driving force behind a lot of it. In OpenStack, especially in the last year, we've seen dozens and dozens of companies who've come out and talked about how they are using OpenStack to, to really capitalize on the opportunities that the software-defined economy brings to them. And these are some of the companies that spoke uh, about their usage at our most recent OpenStack Summit in Vancouver. You can go to openstack.org. We have videos. Every video from all of our summits is, is posted there. And you can go here straight from them. Um, you know, we've done a lot of summits, and we have had a lot of speakers, so there's tens of thousands of hours of video content up there. And uh, it would take a lot of time and effort to get through all of that. So one of the things that I wanted to do to kick the day off is to, to sort of take a bunch of the knowledge, a bunch of the wisdom that these users have shared with the community and have shared with us as we've talked to them, and uh, present four patterns that we've seen that have helped companies um, take the path to production with OpenStack. And when you look at some of the companies that are, are doing this now, you know, these are, are companies of all sizes, deployments of all sizes, uh, but there are some things that are in common across it. And you know, just looking at, at some of the names up here that are using OpenStack in production, you have, uh, you have companies like FICO. They're part of, I think, 97% of the credit decisions that get made. And you know, that's powered by OpenStack now. You have Walmart. They ran 100% their, uh, of their holiday traffic last year on top of OpenStack. You have PayPal. 100% of their uh, front-end production traffic is running on OpenStack. So real usage happening with real companies at scale, big piece of our economy, and tools that we interact with every day. So how do they get there? Four patterns to run through quickly. The first one, no matter what size they end up with, all of these companies that I've talked to that have had a successful OpenStack deployment have started with a very specific focus. And I think that, that this is uh, really a critical pattern anytime that you're adopting a new technology. You know, when a new technology comes out, it can be really exciting to think about the possibilities, um, but also there are always challenges with it. And, uh, you know, everybody uh, knows that, that uh, the, the first version of, of a piece of software, the first version of a piece of hardware, it has glitches and you have to work through those. These companies, what they did is, is they found specific users that uh, within their organization that were going to benefit from the advantages that OpenStack could bring, agility, time to market, speed of development. And they worked with those users almost like VIP beta customers, internal customers. They talked to them about what do they need, what's working, how do we fix this so that it's really valuable for you. And then what you see is those internal customers turn into internal promoters, and all of a sudden, um, you know, companies across, or users across the organization are really demanding that they have access to this infrastructure. One of the uh, really interesting organizations that, that came and talked about this a couple of years ago was, was the NSA, the National Security Administration. And, uh, and that's, you know, you don't necessarily think of, a, of, of them kind of taking that uh, small team startup approach inside of an organization like that, but they did, and, and they were very successful. Um, I mentioned Walmart a little earlier. You know, you, Walmart is massive company, they have massive scale. This is a, uh, a graph of their path to production with OpenStack. And you'll notice that obviously a lot of buildup, especially to this last um, holiday season, but back there in 2013, they were running select workloads in production on OpenStack already, but at you know, a tenth of the scale of what they run now. They had users internally that wanted that agility, that wanted to be able to move faster, that wanted to be able to self-service uh, their own infrastructure. And, uh, and so you know, that was where they started. They worked out the kinks there, and they moved on. So once you've found those critical early adopters who are going to be your promoters, who are going to help you tune the product, then you start thinking about, how do I take this to, to larger scale? And that's when the team really comes into play. So the second pattern that we've seen is that companies who 
are successfully deploying OpenStack, they look for experience operating horizontal services. You know, this isn't just about can I take um, a, you know, some kind of monolithic application and, and vertically scale it and tune it and make it perform. That's a very valuable skill. But OpenStack is a collection of services. Um, you know, sometimes people call it a framework. And, uh, and so you're going to have a number of different services. They're going to scale independently. They're going to have different failure modes. They're going to have different uh, uh, areas of optimization and configuration. And that's a, uh, that's a skill set that, that's out there, but may not be um, something that, uh, that you have on your team right now or that, uh, that you have a lot of experience with. You know, this isn't just an app server, a database server, a storage system. And so finding someone with the experience of operating horizontal services, distributed services at scale is really important. And I think one of the really key things to remember with, uh, with a cloud environment, when you get into elastic workloads and self-service, people are running, um, it's much more arbitrary about what's going to be running in your environment. You're not going to have as much insight and control over exactly what's on this machine. And so you need to have people that think almost like a service provider. And you know, you can hire them. You may already employ them. Um, but uh, what a lot of successful users do is they work with some of the different organizations in, uh, in the OpenStack ecosystem. And you can go to openstack.org slash marketplace and find a variety of, uh, of companies who uh, provide different models. And you're going to hear about that through the next couple of days, but different models for delivering OpenStack. And it's really, really key to, uh, to consider how you find that experience. Um, some of the, the users that we talk about that are running at huge scale, they have small teams internally, but they've found really good experts in the community, really good experts in, in the ecosystem. So once you have you know, found your early adopters and started to scale it, it's time to take it all the way across the organization. And you know, that first step is really about creating the carrot and finding the people who want that carrot. But eventually, if you really want it to be something that takes hold everywhere, then uh, you may need a little stick. <laughs> And so um, you know, this is when organizations start to think about what is their policy going to be for infrastructure. And uh, you know, people say cloud first, or I said cloud preferred here. The idea is really that, uh, that um, at some point, you're going to have to put a stake in the ground and say, going forward, our preferred deployment uh, model for new resources, for new applications, is on the cloud. And you, know, you may need to think about writing applications a little differently. You may need to think about um, provisioning resources on a different timeline. Uh, the, those are all things that, uh, that, that end up taking place. Uh, we had uh, another user who spoke about this in Vancouver from uh, TD Bank, Graham Peacock. And uh, this was a quote from, from his session in Vancouver. He said, if they can't build it on cloud, they need to get my permission to obtain a physical server, which is pretty hard to get. This is TD Bank. You know, they're a massive organization. They are in the financial services industry. They have lots of legacy workloads. But this is the strategy that they are, are um, really getting behind. And so they have the policies that are going to help them be successful there. And Graham is not you know, just an administrator. You know, he's not the, uh, the, the BOFH who uh, is just grumpy and doesn't want people to, to do things that he doesn't like. He's VP of engineering. But that's how important it is to their organization overall. You know, it's strategic for them over the long term to change the way that they manage IT. And, uh, and you know, there are other things that they do in concert with this. It's not just about saying no. They have trained thousands of their developers on how to get the most out of cloud. Because when, uh, when their developers understand the benefits, then you know, they want to go to cloud. And this you know, policy that, that Graham has put in place it doesn't become a problem. You know, it just kind of reinforces their path to production and their strategy for infrastructure overall. And the, the final pattern, which you know, you could say this one should come first, but it's that uh, you have to do cloud for a good reason. When I was here last year, I spoke, and uh, um, how many of you were here last year, actually? That's, OK, so a lot of new people. That's good. So I, I had a slide that had a bunch of random things on there, like a, a, a jet pack and a, 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 a lie detector and just all these random things. And the question is, what do they all have in common? And what they all had in common is they were things that the professor invented on Gilligan's Island instead of plugging two holes in a boat. <laughs> and if you watch that series, you know, he always had some amazing thing that he made. But uh, there were still holes in the boat, and they were still stuck on the island. 
And the point is that you have to do things for the right reason. You know, you can't just go build a cloud, especially, you know, go build a private cloud um, for just because you, it's cool technology and you think you want to do it. And companies that have done that, you know, a lot of times have run into trouble and, and there are a lot of failed private cloud projects out there. But the companies that, that are really successful with it, they have good reasons. And there are a lot of good reasons, whether it's public cloud or private cloud, to, uh, to, to go out and, and build your cloud strategy. And it can be things like cost cutting, it can be things like time to market and, and speeding up product development cycles. It could be about breaking down silos and getting rid of islands in your technology. Um, but you know, it's something that, uh, that there are a lot of reasons and you need to find it, make sure that it's very clear to your teams, to your executives, to the organization overall, why you're doing this. And then all of those other, uh, those other patterns, much easier to implement. Um, a couple of examples here. One is a, a car company that uh, they are one of the, the top auto manufacturers in the world. They collect data from all of their vehicles, from all of their dealerships, from social media. They have a big data analytics platform that, that analyzes all of this. And, uh, and I think since they rolled this out, they've, been, they've collected multiple petabytes just from the sensors in their cars that, that's going into this environment. So it's, uh, it's something that you know, is, is a really cool um, use case. Uh, and it allows them to have better insight into the experience of their drivers. But the other thing that, that's, uh, that's really key to it and why they implemented OpenStack is because they had a, an appliance, one of these big vertical systems that they were trying to do this process on, and it could not handle all the data that was coming in. They um, built an OpenStack environment, uh, used some modern big data tools, and were able to, uh, to run all of these jobs. And that new environment they built was a tenth the cost of the old environment. That's a great reason. And you know, we uh, heard from another user, Tapjoy, in Paris. Similar thing. They were all public cloud user. They do tons of data science. They have half a billion monthly users um, to their uh, mobile analytics platform. If you, if you ever get an ad on your phone from a game or anything like that, there's a good chance that uh, Tapjoy is, is involved in that somehow. They moved specific data science workloads from public cloud to private cloud and they're able to get five to 10x the capacity for the same price. So you know, if you are having trouble justifying cloud, uh, if you're having trouble understanding why it makes sense, you know, the, then, uh, then these are a couple of examples of people who have found really good reasons. When you can say, we're gonna save 10x or we're gonna get 5x the capacity, uh, it suddenly becomes a, a much easier sell. So you know, those are four patterns. These are all things that, that we hear from our users all the time. And like I said earlier, you can go uh, hear a lot of, uh, of this content directly from them on, on our website. The, uh, I've got a bonus one here, which is use OpenStack to build a platform for innovation. And this, I think, you know, is not, uh, not something that, that has necessarily happened everywhere in all of these use cases yet, but that I'm starting to hear people doing. And that's what I, uh, what I kind of wanted to, to touch on here for just a couple of minutes. You know, all of these things that we're talking about, they get back to compute, storage, and networking. You know, processing data, storing data, moving data. And that's what, what OpenStack provides is a framework for compute, storage, and networking. And it does that in this plug-in model with uh, dozens of drivers across all of those different technology components. Whether you're talking about virtualization, whether you're talking about storage, you know, there are commercial options, there are open source options, and, uh, and it's really powerful to be able to plug all of those different uh, technology components in and be able to, uh, to you know, take advantage of, of all this technology. So that's a really key benefit that, uh, that people find with OpenStack. What it points to, though, is really that underneath all of it, OpenStack operates as an integration engine. You know, it's a layer that takes different kinds of hardware, different uh, types of, of systems, integrates them into a unified platform that your developers and your users can access on top of it. And so to talk a little bit about that, I want to bring up uh, my special guest. We're really fortunate to have a user here today. Help me welcome Amit Tank. So thanks for uh, joining us today, Amit. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Could you start out just by um, telling everybody a little bit about what you're doing with, with OpenStack? Sure, yeah. So uh, a little bit of uh, prologue. Uh, there are traffic loads, and then there is NFL traffic load. <laughs> uh, 
there are load spikes, uh, and then there is a load spike that results from pack your Mayweather uh, pay-per-view event. So uh, at DirecTV, our team is chartered with uh, this directive to bring uh, uh, some really uh, tough but really interesting problems like auto scaling, uh, demand response, uh, uh, load spike uh, scaling, uh, some of these kind of uh, problems. To solve these problems, uh, uh, how can we bring OpenStack in production and uh, solve some of these business problems and also achieve other innovations that come along? So that's our charter. Right, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, we've talked a couple of times and you've talked about the various environments that you have to integrate and, you know, legacy and existing virtualization and then, you know, where you want to get to to be more agile and be able to handle those traffic spikes better. Can you talk a little bit about how you um, are putting the strategy together around all of those different uh, scenarios? Sure, great question. So I think it goes back to the slide that you uh, showed earlier about uh, you have these abilities to, uh, this ability to work with different blocks of technology. And I can, uh, I'm sure that the business audience here uh, can relate to this uh, idea that if you're gonna uh, build a cloud technology, you're not gonna be able to necessarily build it in vacuum. You have to take your existing workload and you have to answer the question about how are you gonna uh, integrate it nicely with your existing uh, uh, infrastructure. And that's where I think OpenStack really shines. We see a lot of value proposition in terms of, uh, if you want to take it to the end production uh, level, uh, there are stages that you'll probably end up have, having to travel, which is probably, uh, you'll start with something like CICD DevOps environment, which is more catering towards your internal development cycle. And as you said earlier, you build some brand ambassadors within your own organization. Take it to something like a partner integration uh, environment, which is slightly more elevated form of uh, 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 involved form of environment where different third party components are now integrated there. And from there on, the next leap is end to end test environment, which is pretty much going to be like mimicking your production environment. If you can prove within your uh, organization, your management, upper management, executive leadership, and your technology uh, audience that it works nicely in end to end environment, it's pretty much then uh, ready for production. Okay. So, um... Alex and, uh, was introducing earlier today, and he was saying that we're going to talk a lot about other technologies and, and technologies that are on the horizon. How do you see OpenStack playing into um, your adoption of some of these emerging technologies, like containers and container management frameworks? Sure, very good question. So I think uh, the answer to that question goes through the concept of uh, being able to solve some of the business problems that we talked about earlier in a vendor-agnostic, multi-hypervisor, hybrid cloud format. So. Uh, think of it as uh, hypervisor is if you can have multiple hypervisors and you want to be able to uh, have a, a cloud, OpenStack cloud, that can integrate with, uh, say, a virtual F5, being able to, on the fly, create WIP and add things to the pool. Uh, OpenStack is probably the only game where it gives you this path to production to solve uh, problems like your load times using containers. Down the line, let's say you have an amazing load balancer as a service product coming from a startup, and you want to integrate that in your environment. Uh, OpenStack is probably the only platform that allows you to pick and choose the best of the breed and make it work with your existing infrastructure. And we see that as our real way to basically bring all of these containers as well as other emerging technologies into our production, like our path to production. Great. I love that phrase, path to production. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, Amit's going to be around today and is happy to talk to anyone who may have other questions. So thank, thank you, you, Amit. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. <laughs> may I make a small oh, uh, yes, point? Absolutely. So uh, uh, I'm really fortunate. DirecTV is now a proud member of at and family. And uh, I work for my VP, my directors. They are amazing business leaders. And for any technologists out here, if they want to impact on how America consumes NFL video or how America consumes uh, content, uh, they should de definitely consider DirecTV as a great place to work and bring their innovations. <laughs> <laughs> Always recruiting. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's the, it's the, uh, that's the, the OpenStack uh, recruiting as a service project that we have. <laughs> so, you know, Amit was talking about the path to production, and, and I want to wrap up with just the last few minutes that I have here talking a little bit about how that fits into OpenStack. And I think that uh, as you look at all of the technologies that are part of OpenStack, all of the technologies that are really exciting, you know, that have a lot of potential that are emerging right now, um, there are a few ways to, to sort of, uh, I think, kind of chart them out. And this is, this is something that, uh, that 
we started talking about a few months ago as we specifically looked at the, um, the OpenStack ecosystem of projects. You know, I, I don't know how many of you follow it closely, but there are, are many, many OpenStack projects now. It started out as just a couple, and now there are, are dozens. And, uh, and that can be confusing sometimes when you look at it. But it's, a, it's sort of a, a right tool for the right job thing. And I think that most technology, you can kind of chart it on this uh, quadrant of maturity and, and adoption. And you know, the things that are not widely adopted and that are not very mature, those are the experiments. Um, the things that, uh, that are uh, not very mature, really widely adopted, those are unicorns. And unicorns don't really exist. You know, even things that seem like they're overnight successes, like Uber or whatever, they've been around for years and, and they have the hockey stick effect. Um, you've got the, uh, the, the top um, left corner here, which those are the mature but not very widely adopted technologies. That's the niche, you know, that's the things that are important to people but don't necessarily really build out broadly across a platform. And then you have the things that are, you know, the, uh, the winners that widely adopted, very mature, and go on to, to be really important pieces of, of the technology infrastructure. And, and so one of the things that we think in the OpenStack community, this reflects the way we build projects and kind of bring them into the community, is that experimentation um, really is something that leads to breakthroughs. And you get, uh, that's how you get into the, the winner's circle. So you know, if you look around and you look back when we started OpenStack in 2010, there were some existing technologies that were really close to making that breakthrough. You know, virtualization was starting to become widely adopted widely accepted as, as a, a technology. The um, OpenStack component that managed virtualization, Nova, was, was a super early experiment. I think it was 12,000 lines of code or something like that at the time. So very early on. But you know, you move forward to, uh, to where we are now. And uh, you see, five years later, virtualization, extremely widely adopted. And uh, OpenStack compute is also extremely widely adopted. I was looking at some of our user survey data recently, and we have over 1,000 deployments um, in our deployment database, our opt-in deployment database at the foundation now of OpenStack Compute. And there are you know, um, many others that are, that are not tracked in that. But uh, you know, this is, is something where it, it's achieved that. If you expand this out, though, and you look at kind of OpenStack overall, what you'll see is that various projects are in various stages of adoption and advancement of the technology. And I think this is a really important concept to keep in mind as you look at OpenStack or as you really look at, at any um, potential technologies. And you'll notice that the, the projects that are kind of the, uh, the, the pieces that have become part of uh, the core interoperability guidelines, those ones are all up at the top right. Um, but you know, there are companies who are running some of these other projects in production today. It doesn't mean that you can't use them. But I think this is a, you know, an interesting way to chart it and important to think about. If you go up to the top right, it's going to be more stable, more well tested. People have more experience running it. You know, if you go down to the bottom left, you might still get a huge value out of it. Again, you know, going back to pattern number four, if you're doing it for the right reason, um, but you might have to put more effort into it. And I think that you know, if we think about today, what, uh, what, what's happening is we see tons of experimentation happening. We see a lot of things happening down in, uh, in that bottom quadrant with uh, um, software-defined networking, with containers, with things like Kubernetes. Um, you know, Craig from Google is going to talk in just a few minutes. And, and all of that is awesome, tons of potential. But you know, we have to really think about how do we adopt it? And as Amit said, you know, how do we find the path to production for those technologies? I think that one of the things that, uh, that we're starting to see some OpenStack deployments do is they go back to this, you know, compute, storage, and networking. These are the pillars of everything every application, every workload, they run on top of this. And OpenStack provides a framework that lets them tie that into existing systems, existing enterprise storage systems, existing identity systems, but also bring in those experiments in a way where they're able to, to adopt them and make use of them, sometimes faster than they would without OpenStack. And I think that's a huge value that OpenStack is starting to bring to people. You know, when people start out in OpenStack deployment, a lot of times it looks like this. You know, it's a set of physical machines with a bunch of hypervisors on it. But over time, they may need a workload that uh, runs directly on top of bare metal. And so they uh, you know, can make use of the Ironic service to provision some workloads straight onto bare metal machines and get full performance 
um, take advantage of specific hardware. Uh, they may bring in containers. And you know, one of the patterns with containers is uh, when you're first starting out with containers, when you're not sure about how an application is going to perform or the kind of isolation it needs, you may run them inside of a, of a virtual machine to use the hypervisor to provide that isolation. But over time, you may want the um, kind of ultimate uh, performance and the ultimate density out of it, and so you put those containers directly on bare metal. And OpenStack is really the only platform that supports all of these technologies and all of these deployment methodologies, and that is why I think it's so valuable and so exciting to, to, to people. Alan Waite is an analyst at Gartner, and uh, they, were, they had a conference a couple weeks ago in San Diego that I was at, and he said that he thought that OpenStack was the best candidate for a cross-platform API and the data center to take on all these technologies. And you know, he's also, um, he's, he's very into OpenStack, so he knows where the, uh, the issues are and the pitfalls, but he thinks you know, going forward, like, this, is, this is a huge opportunity and potential for us. And the thing that's great about it, you know, that we always talk about, is you can get this in so many different form factors. You, know, you can get this in, in a public cloud, uh, paying by the hour, or you can get it in a private cloud that's customized to your workload, or you can get five to 10x the capacity for the same price, and it's all you know, OpenStack powered, all making use of the same APIs and the same code. So one last thing that I, uh, I wanted to mention, um, you know, the reason that you build out this kind of infrastructure is ultimately to run applications on top of it, and a lot of times to build software on top of it. And we, uh, we actually just um, launched this morning a new uh, application developer section on our website. And it's got uh, a bunch of content in there to help um, app developers make better use of OpenStack clouds, uh, API documentation, different uh, white papers. We actually have a white paper here this week that we're going to be handing out that is pretty long um, about containers and OpenStack. It was uh, put together with the help of a lot of, uh, a lot of different members of the community. And, uh, and so we're going to have copies of those here. So definitely check out this new section. Check out the container white paper. And um, after this event, as Alex said, you know, this is kind of midway between the summits. We're getting the community together in Tokyo in October. Hopefully uh, some of you guys will be there. It's going to be a great event. Um, it's a little bit of a smaller venue than we had in Vancouver, so don't wait until the last minute to register and book hotels, or you might, might be sad when you arrive in Tokyo. Um, following that, if the Tokyo trip is too far, we're going to be in Austin, Texas at the end of uh, April next year. And that's going to be a, a fun event to go back to. We kicked all of this off in Austin in, uh, in 2010, going back there. Uh, we had 75 then, and we'll have at least 100 times that next year. So it's going to be cool to, to see how that works. And then um, at the end of, uh, of next year in Barcelona, Spain. So yes, <laughs> somebody likes Spain. So thank you guys very much for, uh, for um, coming today and for being part of the community. And uh, I hope that you guys really get a lot out of the next few days and have a good time. So that was great. It's nice to have heard from Amit about what a uh, real global company is doing. But we thought OpenStack is so pervasive that it would make sense to just try and grab someone at random from like just a local company down the street here. So we were lucky enough to get Craig McLucky from Google, which is, I'm not sure what they do, but they're evidently right here. So thanks for stopping by, sir. These are all OpenStack people, which is a compute thing that you'll we'll just we'll, we'll try and it fake out. it. OK, I'll, I'll fake pleasure it. to have you. Thank you so much for okay. having me. All right, so I'm Craig. I'm a, a product guy at Google. I've been doing the cloud thing for a little bit over there. Uh, built a product called Google Compute Engine, uh, which is an infrastructure as a service product. And then more recently have become really uh, fascinated with the idea of, of bringing some of the capabilities that were previously only available to PaaS uh, customers. And they were really very well represented by the way that uh, big internet companies like Google or Facebook or Twitter um, run their applications. And so for this conversation, I'd like to start you know, with the assumption that OpenStack is happening, right? Like OpenStack is actively in the process of democratizing infrastructure as a service. It's making it available to everyone everywhere. And it's solving a very real problem for the enterprise customer, uh, which is 
resource management, resource provisioning, and creating a set of, of virtual constructs that are very accessible and easy to get up and running, to access and to use, and to deploy your code into, right? So that's really the starting point. Now, when you look at what I've been working on for a little while, um, I kind of started there too, right? So I, I started by building a traditional virtual machine computing product at Google because I knew that the world needed virtual computing constructs. I knew that they, we needed to reach the developers where they are and that uh, this, this type one cloud, this infrastructure service cloud, was a critical staging point to do some other interesting things. But at the same time, um, I've been involved at Google and we have had other cloud products. So we had Google, com we had Google Compute Engine, which was just now worked on. But we also had Google App Engine, which was what I'd call a generation one platform as a service product, and a very successful one. And what I started really becoming fascinated by was the huge gulf that existed between Compute Engine and App Engine. The fact that at one end of the spectrum, you could provide your code and everything would just happen for you. And at the other end of the spectrum, you would have a piece of infrastructure that you could SSH into and deploy things on and run. Uh, but there was nothing in between. And I certainly saw some shortcomings in the PaaS space that were gaining adoption and gaining the success and gaining developer's ability to really just embrace something that was going to run their code for them. So I started thinking, like, what's wrong with PaaS? Like, why are people having these experiences? And what it came down to me was really this idea that in PaaS, you encounter these things we call an experiential cliff. So you start off and you have this wonderful love affair with your platform, and it does everything for you, and it just takes care of you in this beautiful way. But eventually you get to a point where you want to do something that your platform can't do. And then it's a cliff. And then you're looking over this cliff, and uh, you're wondering where to go from there. So on the upside, you got this effortless scaling, effortless management, you know, ease of use. You could go from nothing to running code to internet scale very quickly. Um, but you had to give up flexibility to do it. You had to accept a relatively closed and opinionated operating environment to do that. And that meant you had to give up things like having a lot of options around how you'd manage state. So let's say you wanted to run PostgreSQL because you wanted to do some specific um, sort of geo-based querying or something. Um, you would struggle to get to a point where um, you could do that. So you'd have to like, you know, figure out some other option. And generally that meant going back to VMs. So hey, I was in past, I was having this love affair with my technology, and all of a sudden I'm back in the world of VMs. And I always saw this as kind of a leaky bucket problem. You'd have to poke holes in the bucket, uh, and you'd have to actually start you know, running parts of your applications in virtual machines, and you'd have to start investing in infrastructure to manage your applications in virtual machines. You'd have to build multiple discrete environments. And no one wants to do that. No one wants to manage two discrete tool chains. No one wants to be in a world where uh, you have to train your developers with you know, two discrete paradigms of operations. And so eventually, all the water will run out of the bucket, and you're back in the VM world, right? Unless you happen to have a workload that fit perfectly in the PaaS space. And we certainly encountered a lot of that, like particularly for the, the internet scaling scenarios. <clears throat> There's some workloads that work just really well in that environment. And so I started really thinking about this, like what is it that PaaS brings to the world? Like what is it that, that PaaS represents? And, and how do we take that and extricate it and sort of tease it apart into its constituent pieces? And, and who's already doing this? Because like, this is already happening in, in many ways, and I'll get into that. And so the first thing that I think about with PaaS is providing this kind of deterministic and resource efficient deployment model. So I provide it my code, it puts it into some kind of package, and then it will take it out and deploy it into as much infrastructure as I need on a very efficient basis. So the, 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 the modern sort of the, or the, the generation one PaaSes were actually pretty efficient at resource uh, um, allocation. We had a lot of customers running a small, you know, small amounts of code very efficiently in App Engine. And the same is true of any of the other platforms and service offerings. And that's a very powerful thing. The next thing is that they offered up a natural orchestration pattern. So hey, it would take my code and would reason about how to do an update. So hey, I need to go from A to B. I can do that deterministically without interruption, without disruption. That's very powerful. It would monitor my application. It would manage the health of my application. These are all very good things that, that reduce the pressure on your operations team. And it would also offer up a set of curated application environments and a, and a build process. So I could say, hey, here's my code, and it would you know, provide all the other pieces I need in terms of my user land dependencies and, and offer it up to me in a way that was really nicely curated. And then I could just press a button and it would be you know, built and deployed. So all great stuff, all relevant to engineers. 
but not necessarily sensible to tie together into a monolithic thing. And so looking back, I don't know if anyone remembers this company. Uh, they were just another uh, pass platform back in the day. Um, and you know, like a lot of the other pass platforms, they had some interesting technologies. They were certainly on my radar. Um, but they never gained that critical mass of massive adoption, right? But they did something that was really neat. They took one component of PaaS, something that they had had to solve for their own customers, uh, which was packaging and distribution, right? So they, they took the essence of the platforms of service packaging and distribution model, and they turned it into something else, which I think most of you have probably heard about by now, which is Docker. You know, Docker has had quite an impact on, on the, the, the developer and, and sort of operations world out there. Um, they've done some very impressive things. And when I look at Docker, I really think of it as, as being magic in three parts. I think that, that Solomon's put lightning in a bottle. And there's three things that they do just remarkably well and that I am, I'm, I'm very impressed with. And I, I don't think, like, I'd certainly been thinking about containers for a long time. Um, I didn't necessarily see Docker coming until, you know, pretty, you know, like, until they'd actually accomplished some, some remarkable things. And I don't think many other people could have done this, which is, they recognized that the Linux Cisco layer was just an incredibly stable interface uh, between your infrastructure world and your application world, right? So the Linux Cisco layer that exists in Red Hat Enterprise Linux is very like the, Linux, the, the, the Cisco layer that exists in Ubuntu, and it's largely compatible from version to version to version. So if you take that as your starting point and say, this is how my application is going to interface with my um, environment, you have a very stable and ubiquitous interface that offers up legitimate portability. So I can actually take my application, develop it here in one environment, and then move it to a variety of other environments, which is very powerful. I think they recognize the value proposition of a stackable file system. So being able to take a base image, extend it, add your own code, package it up as a hermetically sealed unit, and then redeploy it out. So offered up a remarkable amount of reuse and extensibility and really made your first few hours uh, just wonderful because, hey, I could just go grab something. It's, it's hermetically sealed. It's perfectly packaged. It just works. Uh, I can add my code, and now I can reseal it. I can just deploy it, and it's great. And they also did an amazing job of just creating a really clean and accessible developer experience. So Docker's done uh, you know, super work. And it's, it, as a result of it, it's hugely successful as an open source project. It's garnered a tremendous amount of attention. And developers get some of the essence of PaaS, right? Like a few of the things that PaaS used to do, but they get it on their terms. They get it in an unopinionated fashion. They get it in an open fashion, and they can take it wherever they want to go. And that's a very powerful thing. Hermetically sealed application environments, uh, this portability, and then an efficient resource isolation metaphor. So I don't actually think of, just, just for the record, I don't think of containers as being an effective security isolation domain just yet by itself. I think we'll get there as a community. I still think that you really want to use virtual machines to do um, tenant isolation. But containers do offer efficient resource isolation. They do let you pack a lot of stuff next to each other uh, and, and use up every, uh, every part of your computational uh, resource in, in, a, in a very effective way. So uh, isn't that enough? Aren't we done, right? Like Docker, woo it's, it's done, right? And it's, it's created a really amazing first five hours, right? So you're, you're getting this. Like things just work, it's, it's, a, it's a profound paradigm shift. I really worry about the next five years, right? So now you've built the application, you've had the party, how are you gonna operate it, right? Like you need to be able to take these containers and you need to be able to map them into your OpenStack operating environment, right? So my, I have my computational resources. Do I do just one container per resource? Eh, probably not, a container shouldn't be a VM. It's, it's really more of an executable. So how do I actually map a lot of them into a, a VM boundary? How do I schedule them in such a way that they're using every part of my infrastructure in, in, a, in a remarkable way? How do I wire them into the internet? How do I attach them to my storage properties? Um, you know, I want to use block storage. I have, you know, I want to like wire it into Cinder or um, I want to, you know, wire it into uh, Swift or, or any of the other properties. How do I do that in an efficient fashion so it just feels natural? And then, how do I deal with operations? You know, my engineers should be writing code. They should be really focused on solving my business problems. I really don't want them to spend an inordinate amount of time, you know, focused on, on some of the kind of uh, the nitty gritty operational components. So I need an operational framework. Uh, and you might have heard about this microservices thing. You know, it turns out it's a really neat way to start thinking about factoring your production applications. And uh, we really would like to make sure that as part of this, this transition, as this disruption, 
we don't just reproduce a lot of the mistakes we made previously in terms of the way that applications are architected. We have an opportunity to rethink that. And uh, we have an opportunity to actually bring this microservice oriented you know, technology to market. So in our, uh, Kubernetes, uh, which is a open source uh, technology project um, you know, built by Google, and uh, really embraced by the, the, the community. So it's, it's not just a Google project, it's, it's also a Red Hat project. And it's, it's, a, it's an alloy that's stronger by, its, its, you know, by the open source community that's actually helped build it. And it's something that we're you know, very interested in obviously working with the OpenStack community to bring to this uh, infrastructure as a service world. And for me, in a nutshell, Kubernetes extracts the best of platform as a service orchestration and management. And it does it, in, you know, as, as Docker has done for uh, you know, packaging, deployment, and the development environment, Kubernetes is doing for the operational experience. So you get orchestration and management, and it just works nicely for you. And so if you've ever had trouble with you know, any of these kind of operational realities of you know, making sure you have a, a very cleanly matched development and production environment, that goes beyond just the code you're running the set of common services you use, the tools you use to actually you know, do the deployment, the way that you reason about scaling your application. If you want to be able to test that in, in development and production environment, if you want to transition your code you know, from one environment to the other and make sure that you have an incredibly consistent set of experiences you know, across these environments, you know, Kubernetes might be for you. Um, if you think a lot about if, if, if updating your application in production makes you apprehensive and makes your blood pressure go up by like 30 um, percent, and if, it, if that's, that keeps you awake at night, you might want to think about one of these platforms because they really do distill out a much better way of thinking about operations by providing intelligent systems that will do it for you. Um, if you care about efficiency, you know, these technologies were really born um, of the internet companies. This is the way that Google runs or Facebook runs or Netflix runs. Um, and it's, it's let us get so much more out of our basic infrastructure, you know, achieve several integer multiples, higher levels of efficiency. So if you actually care about the amount of infrastructure you're, you're spending and you want to consolidate and you want to reduce your, uh, your, your capital expenditure um, for infrastructure, these technologies will help you. And if you also care about agility, if you want to be able to start creating applications that grow with your business, where you know, each of your business functions are sort of discreetly represented through these microservices architectures, where you can easily just wire things in and make them accessible, and where your applications aren't bound together and, and coupled to the physical infrastructure primitives they're running on, uh, these technologies might be for you. And so I like to kind of use analogies um, as a way to um, you know, explain this, just to kind of help people really conceptualize what it is. And one of the analogies I'm very fond of using is uh, this, this analogy around model airplanes. So I don't know if you've ever had a model airplane. I used to have one as a child. It was great. We'd do loops. We had a lot of fun. Uh, and then one day, it was 10,000 pieces of balsa wood spread across the sports field, right? Because they're hard to fly. You know? It turns out, like, if you think about it, the way that we run our applications is very similar, right? We give it to an operator, and they, are, they build the thing. They set it up, and then they try to, you know, they run it often. It's not. Sure, they will add autonomous you know, subsystems to you know, help deal with load balancing. But often as not, those are you know, based on very weak heuristics. Turns out, if you think about what's happened with drones now, uh, we've moved you know, to a generationally different thing. Because one of the things that computers do better than people is fly these little model airplanes, right? But it's not just, it's not just better at it. It's not the same thing that just flies a little bit better. It's a fundamentally different thing. By adding dynamic control systems to this little molar plane type metaphor, we've created a profoundly different piece of technology that is able to do things that you could not possibly have done with the best pilot in the world of one of those little model airplanes. Because it turns out there's some things that machines just do better than people, right? And one of those things is using autonomous control systems to achieve an intent-based objective you have. So I can tell my drone, hey, go into the corner of the room, and it will go there. Why aren't application, why isn't application management like that? You know, why aren't we relying on intelligent systems that can observe the operating properties of your application and make informed decisions using these control loops, right? So inside Google, we use this for pretty much everything. We've been using containers for around, I think, 11 years. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the work that, that this, the community's been doing is around technologies that we originally contributed to, uh, to the open source community. 
And what it's given us is a higher level of abstraction. We're operating at the Linux syscall layer. We can actually see what's going on with our applications. We have far higher fidelity data. And as a result of that, we can do clever things with machine learning. We can watch something, and we can see, aha, you know what? This thing's uh, call signature has changed. There's a decent chance someone's exploited it. And I can make an informed operational decision to do that. You know, find one system administrator who's going to actually sit there and watch in real time you know, what's going through on, on you know, millions of systems. People can't do that. Machines can. And we need to bring this kind of capability to the world of application management so that our developers focus on solving problems that they are good at solving. And the machines themselves can solve problems that they're good at solving. And that's all about the operational piece. And so, um, you know, obviously I'm here today because, you know, we look at OpenStack and we, are, we Google, are very impressed with the way that this technology has moved forwards. It's becoming ubiquitous. Uh, it's, it's achieving far better uh, semantic consistency um, across the, the deployment set. And I think there's a real legitimacy to the community. And what we would like to do, what Google would like to do, and how, and how we'd like to operate is, We'd like to meet OpenStack where it is, and we'd like to start bringing a lot more of these kind of cloud-native paradigms. So contribute our expertise, contribute technology to the OpenStack community to help it move forwards and get over the energy curve so that every OpenStack developer can be running cloud-native. Uh, so every OpenStack developer is benefiting from this new class of management. They're able to focus on their code rather than operations. Uh, they're able to get remarkably higher efficiencies without sacrificing uh, the, 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 the fundamental you know, uh, robustness and reliability of their subsystems. And we're very excited that uh, this is already happening. You know, the community's already rallied around this. Um, you know, we see um, Magnum adding a native Kubernetes uh, API uh, to OpenStack you know, through, through, through a Python uh, sort of head on the project. We see uh, Murano as, a, as an easy way to get these technologies up and running. And what you'll start to see from us you know, over the next uh, you know, couple of months as, as we really you know, focus our, our attention on this is, is hopefully far more natural integration across the OpenStack stack. So I think about things like um, you know, really working you know, together to, to create this, this part of Cloud Native and as a community addressing some of the obvious uh, kind of cognitive gaps that exist or, or like create a really nice microservices model it makes it very natural to find, discover, and consume uh, a, a piece of technology. Realistically, I know that almost every customer who's running a real deployment isn't going to have their entire application, you know, insofar as everything it touches, packaged up into one of these kind of you know, whiz-bang cloud-native environments. The reality is they still have to interface with a lot of their existing work. So we need to make that integration model very natural. We should make it completely transparent, whether you're accessing something that's a cloud-native component, uh, you know, from outside a cluster or from inside a cluster if you're accessing something that's running in a vertically scalable VM. We need to create a consistency of experience. Um, we need better integration with a lot of the basic subsystems. I mean, you know, our friends in the OpenStack community have you know, already done a lot of work to, to make sure that these things work. But I think there's a lot of opportunity as we think about applications becoming, you know, far more network, network or storage centric to actually get deep integration with, with properties like, uh, like Neutron. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we should be thinking about a, a solution to actually bring, you know, on the metal um, execution to, uh, to the OpenStack community. I think that, you know, VMs have a, a very bright and vibrant future, and they're the only way to achieve legitimate security isolation right now. Um, but for a lot of people that don't need that, there's, there's a very efficient story around just scheduling containers on bare metal, and we should be thinking about that as a community. And so I'm, I'm really excited about this. Um, I thank you for your time. And uh, if you want to sort of ask me questions, you can find me you know, sort of drifting around this afternoon. And uh, with that, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Um, so that's interesting. Craig, you were at Microsoft, right? And James is now at Microsoft from Forrester. So I think I see a solution to this problem with fewer transitions. I'm going to write up a quick paper for you. All right, without further ado, we've got James Staten, who was uh, basically a VP and principal analyst at Forrester up until recently, where he found an opportunity that was too good to resist. He is now the chief strategist for the cloud and enterprise division at Microsoft. Super knowledgeable about, obviously, the entire industry, so it's a pleasure to have him. So please join me in welcoming James Staten.
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back here and participating with you guys. I was at the, Jonathan talked about the very first OpenStack Summit. Um, I was at that one as, and the second one. So it's good to see that this section over here, you guys were the attendees of the first one and we've grown it quite a bit, which is fantastic. Um, now, I love the way Jonathan started this out because one of the things he talked about when he talked about sort of the best practices to do with your OpenStack implementation, he talked very much about have an idea about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Understand what the developers are actually looking for and treat it as an opportunity for innovation. Those are all really important things to say. And what's common about all the things he said? They have nothing to do with configure the technology this way, choose this hardware, do this type of uh, study. It has nothing to do with the technology. And that is really important because the biggest challenge we continue to see when it comes to private cloud implementations is that the focus needs to be on organizational psychology more than on the technology. And most of you wouldn't be here in this room if you felt that OpenStack wasn't ready for implementation. The challenge is most IT departments aren't ready. And part of this comes down to the relationship that IT departments have with developers. More often than not, they really don't have a very strong knowledge about what developers are looking for, why they consume the public cloud services that they do. And they also don't have really good relationships with the line of business, who more often than not are the ones who are trying to drive the innovation, and therefore are the people that are going out and using SaaS services, public cloud services, and circumventing IT with their shadow IT initiatives to take advantage of this. So the first thing all the IT administration teams should do is concentrate on understanding why your company's employees are circumventing what you provide. And when you look at surveys from Forrester, from Gartner, from other organizations, you tend to see the same thing. You tend to see this list of the reasons they go out and use the public cloud. And these are all pretty straightforward. We're all pretty familiar with these. But what's not on this list? This is what's not on this list. Developers in line of business are not looking to IT any longer to say, where should I deploy this? They are not waiting for IT to confirm that it is compatible and it works with the things that IT is running in the data center. They're frankly not going to the cloud because it's cheaper. So those in IT who feel like that's what I've got to do, I've got to be the cheapest solution out there, no. If you looked at the previous list, it's about speed, it's about innovation, it's about empowering the productivity of developers at the skill sets that they have. That's what's really most important. And notice the last one, they actually don't care whether IT supports that solution. Now you might read that and then you say to yourself, well, wait a second, if they don't want my support, then what, what's going on here? Did I do something wrong? Um, am I not relevant to the business going forward? Well, that's something we all have to pay attention to because the old definition of IT is under pressure from the changes that are coming into the organization. IT is still held responsible for the security and the privacy, managing our assets, ensuring that people are not taking our assets and sending them out into the public. Um, they're not taking our intellectual property or our patents and tweeting them out so everybody can read them. All of that's still really important. But IT is no longer in charge of the services and capabilities that are being leveraged by the business. And as much as IT wants to be back in charge, you no longer are in a position where you can say, thou shalt not public cloud. So when you're not in a position in which you can stop people from doing things, you have to rethink your role. Um, and you also have to think about your relevance too, because if you sort of say, well, fine, they've gone, they want to use all the services that are out there, let them go for it. Um, when they screw up, the, then they, and they, you know, get our intellectual property in trouble or they share some information about our customers and that gets in trouble, well, they're the ones who are gonna get fired. No, because again, IT's role is to protect the assets, which means you have to be on board with how technology is being used in your company. And you have to shift the role of IT away from the role of we make the technology to we help our company use the technology. Now, when we look at private clouds, 
IT departments typically look at a private cloud as a linear progression upward from the things they already do. They've already run the operating system and the infrastructure. Now they've put virtualization on top of it. Um, a private cloud to them is more standardization, more automation of the environment. And usually about that point is when they say, done, private cloud. Now, that's probably a pretty big mistake because, as we talked about at the beginning, you need to understand what your developers want. And developers look at a private cloud from the top down. They will look and they will say, is it self-service? Does it allow me to tap into these resources myself, not fill out a form, wait six weeks, and then you give me some VMs? Does it allow me at my skill set to be able to drop applications in here and scale them out horizontally? Can I take advantage of this platform like I would take advantage of the public cloud services? So if IT declares victory, our private cloud is automated, and they do not provide self-service, they do not provide the ability to scale it horizontally, it's going to get rejected. And if you saw Tom Bittman's recent survey, he's an analyst at Gartner, where he talked to a whole audience of people at a Gartner conference about their private cloud initiatives, what did that survey show? He asked how successful your cloud is. How much is your private cloud being used? And the response that came back, 95% of the respondents said our private cloud is failing. This is the reason. So it's not that OpenStack was the wrong stack. It's not that they chose the wrong technology to do this. It's that they didn't understand the value proposition and build the product to the requirements of the organization. And that means that they are running the risk of being circumvented yet again. And if you build a private cloud and no one comes to use it, it's not a field of dreams unless you like nightmares. So we have to really say IT needs to change its role, its point of view, how it interacts with the organization going forward. And most importantly, I've, it's, it's been a really long time since I ran into an IT professional who said, when I got out of college and I decided to join IT, I was dying to run that 1995 SAP system. I just love working on yesterday's technology. That's awesome. Unfortunately, some of those do exist. They're usually about a year away from retirement. But for the rest of us, the reason we got into IT was because we wanted to do this. We wanted to bring new ideas. We wanted to evangelize technology for our companies. We wanted to help the company innovate. We wanted to help the company transform. So let's do that. Let's step up. It's time to do that. The technologies are here. But in order for us to do this, we have to look at the IT department differently. We have to recognize that some of the skill sets, some of the focuses, some of the roles, some of the responsibilities have to change. And this is exactly what happened in Microsoft when Satya came in and said to our IT department, we were going to be a mobile first and a cloud first organization. We are going to allow our employees to bring Macs into the office. We're going to put all of our applications on iOS and on Android. We're going to be wherever our customers and wherever our employees are, and we're going to make sure they're productive in all those environments. And you guys in IT, you're going to have to empower that. So that was a little bit of a shock to an IT department that was 100% on one platform and ran things out of their own data center. And they knew this thing was going on over in the cloud division, this thing called Azure, but they weren't really sure how to tap into it and take advantage of it. And so they started paying attention to that. So when they did that, they looked inside and they said, we've got a series of skills and org structures around our traditional data center architecture today. And when we say we're going to move to a cloud first model, there's some changes we got to make. Yes, we still need technical people, but what they manage, how they're organized, what they pay attention to, that changed. So we don't need, in this new cloud-first world, people who necessarily own specific parts of infrastructure. We don't need the handshake that goes between the server guy, the networking guy, and the storage guy in order to get things done. We need to actually think about, we are the managers of services that we provide, and managers of services that our employees are going to tap into. And that means that we have to change what we focus on. 
And biggest change overall was instead of working on and managing commodity te technologies, we now have to engage the business and understand how they're using these services and how we can empower them to use the services more effectively. And that was the biggest part of the change in our IT department. And we're not done by any means. You know, this takes a long time because you'll run into people who say, well, I've always defined my role this way. I have all these skills. I have these certifications. I know these tools incredibly well. What do you mean I have to change? Well, as part of that, it's important that IT leaders take an active role in helping their employees see what is that career path. Where are their skills applicable in the new world? And that's a big part of what Microsoft IT has been focusing on as well. So we had a series of roles that you see at the top of the board here. Um, you've probably seen these same roles inside your organization. And they found that there were a series of new roles that you see at the bottom of this page that they needed to move people into. In some cases, like the last one up there, the DBA, well, when you are tapping into cloud-based SQL database, you don't set up and, and configure the database, nor do you set up and configure the database cluster. That's done. So if you're a DBA, what's your future? Well, think about the skills a DBA has. Think about what he's really good at. He may be really good at information management.